Wendell was a panhandler near my college. I always gave him my change when I had extra. Usually I keep a hard rule not to give money to individuals because I give it to known local charities instead, where I can be sure the money is going to a specific cause. This one panhandler though, he always sang opera music. Quite beautifully, all things considered. Even though it was clear he was begging for money due to poverty and homelessness, not busking for tips, I always thought it was admirable that he was trying to perform a service in exchange for the money, and I don't like carrying coins, so I gave what I could, it wasn't much. Barely a dollar each time. I would occasionally strike up conversations with Wendell even if I didn't have any money for him. He liked to make students laugh with funny impressions or jokes. He was a bit older, I'm an undergrad, he was probably 40 esto 50s, so we'd mostly have quick chats about the news or the weather or whatever. Nothing deep. Sometimes he'd randomly share something so intimate that I'd feel obligated to reciprocate with something at least superficially personal. Example, he blurred out that he almost went to college on a baseball scholarship but drugs ruined everything. I'd be like, oh, wow, sorry to hear that. I play volleyball. Not for a scholarship though. See you around, okay? Once Wendell called me over while I was walking with the professor slash my advisor, and I didn't want to be rude so I went over just to say a quick hello and introduce my advisor. When we walked away my advisor was pretty clearly horrified and asked why Wendell knew me by name. I explained our little friendship. He said the homeless in this city weren't like the homeless in my smaller town back home. I figured he was being elitist and I think he could tell I hadn't taken him seriously because after we dropped the subject, just before I left, he reiterated that I shouldn't forge friendships with the homeless population in this city or even give them money because the chronically homeless, the ones on the streets enough that you could get to know them, tended to have criminal or addictive histories. I was surprised because my advisor is usually pretty progressive and compassionate so I appealed to him with, Wendell is a victim of a post-capitalist society, and all the other things I'd learned in his very own classes, but he wasn't having any of it, basically saying however Wendell became chronically homeless, now he was and I should act accordingly. So my professor strongly implored me not to continue even talking to Wendell at all. I kind of shook my head thinking, okay boomer, and if anything, felt fortified by the warning. Like it was a confirmation that I was a radical doing the right thing, leading a new path, breaking down barriers, bettering society. I got closer to Wendell and shared more about my life with him. But the very next time I talked to Wendell he was really irritable and distant and I wasn't sure why. Until he said, so your boyfriend, you two live together or what? and I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, what boyfriend? And he said, the guy I met from yesterday you were walking down the street with. And I laughed, explaining it wasn't my boyfriend, it was just my academic advisor. Then all of a sudden he wasn't irritable anymore. He was as chatty as he'd ever been. I probably should have taken that as a red flag, but I didn't think about Wendell much at all then. I only saw him once or twice a week, and only for a few minutes. It was around then that Wendell started bringing me gifts, I'd pass him and he'd have a flower for me or a metal machine piece. I never refused, because I figured it was a means of preserving his dignity when accepting money, like with his opera singing. One of my roommates remarked on the flower once, and when I explained she said it was weird. I thought she was also just being elitist and that I was enlightened, bridging the class divide, and superior to her neoliberal paranoia. I mean, come on, it was just a flower. My advisor clocked all this so brought it up with me again a while later saying he was worried I was being manipulated. I tried to tell him about Wendell's opera singing and impressions and how he even almost went to college but then I remembered the reason he lost his baseball scholarship and I stopped short. Looking at it through that lens kind of made me reconsider the whole thing. I thought about what my professor had said, sparing the details, we did talk for like half an hour, and I finally connected the dots that Wendell did have a history of drug use, and he did sometimes mention how a previous girlfriend, overreacting, to something he'd done had derailed his life besides the drugs, so I decided maybe I should think about distancing myself a little. But very shortly after, the pandemic hit and classes went virtual, so to save on rent I went home to my parents' house. Still in the state, but not near campus at all. About three weeks into being home I was watching a friend's Insta story when I heard Wendell singing opera in the background and I thought, ah, I forgot all about him. Hope he's doing alright. And that was that, I kept watching different stories. Later that night, something about the story kind of stuck in my gut. It had popped into my mind a few times subconsciously and I'd ignored it, but it kept coming back, so I decided to go and watch it again. That's when I realized my friend's video wasn't from our college town. It was from my much smaller hometown, which is nowhere near my college. That freaked me out a little. 
but I figured, everyone moved around when the pandemic hit. My town isn't that small. It isn't that far from the college. It was probably a coincidence. I really wanted to mention it to my parents, but they had always warned me against talking to homeless people. Besides, like, can I buy you a meal? So I felt too embarrassed to explain the situation to them. Especially since it was probably a coincidence and I would sound so conceited if I were like, he definitely followed me because aren't I just so great that he's probably obsessed with me? We have a type 1 diabetic in the family, so we took quarantining very seriously. I figured, I'll never see him, anyways. I'm not going out anytime soon. It doesn't matter where he is. And nothing happened. Well, one thing. A girl from my high school who also ended up at my college called me and, in summary, said, this is going to sound really weird, but I feel like I should say something. I was downtown and a beggar asked me about you. Like, specifically, you. He knew you were in club volleyball. He knew your major. I didn't tell him anything, but I thought you should know. I was pretty alarmed at first, because, how would he know I know this girl? But once we talked I learned she'd been wearing a sweatshirt from our college. So I thought about it and decided he probably saw that sweatshirt, figured she might know me from college since we were both from this town, and was just trying to find out how I was doing. I thought it was sweet. Also a little weird. But he was a little weird, that was part of his charm. I thanked her but told her not to worry about it. Besides, I wasn't in town much longer anyways. I had decided to go live back near campus. It was impossible to get my coursework done with my whole family around all day. So I went back to campus a while later. Didn't think about Wendell at all. Until I saw him back on the same corner just a week after I returned to campus. Okay, even I knew at that time that something was wrong. I stopped giving him money, stopped talking to him. But I was so humiliated by how high and mighty I had been insisting that nothing was wrong and everyone else was being paranoid and elitist, that I decided not to tell anyone what I had noticed. I was already barely leaving my apartment, never going on campus, and his usual spot was right by campus. I felt bad about potentially hurting his feelings or reading too far into the situation, but I figured he'd get the message, and better safe than sorry. After finals I decided to visit my brother, in a different state. His roommate had moved home, leaving an extra bed, so I drove up to his place to celebrate the end of the year and get away from it all. About the ninth day in, I was woken up way earlier than usual, when my brother isn't working or in school he sleeps until noon, to the sound of my brother talking at the door. I got up to see what was going on, because we weren't seeing anyone, we stayed totally quarantined, the state was being hit hard. My brother was talking nicely to someone outside through a crack in the door, but when he turned he looked royally pissed at me. He turned back outside and said, hold on here. Close the door, despite the other guy protesting, but I couldn't hear what he said exactly. My brother immediately got in my face and, whisper yelling, said, mom and dad are gonna kill you. I had no idea what he was talking about, but my first thought was the cops had come to arrest me for something. It was the only logical thought I could generate first thing in the morning. The only thing I could imagine being arrested for was my fake ID, which I only even used to get into concerts, and obviously none lately, so I was really in shock. But my brother was still going, as best I can remember because I was panicked at this point, he was saying, and I'm gonna kill you. This is so not cool. You didn't even ask. I wouldn't have said yes anyways. But you didn't even think to ask. I realized that didn't align with being arrested so finally I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, you're dating a 40 year old guy. Older. 45 maybe. Of all the people out there, I mean, Jesus. Dad's gonna kill you and then have a heart attack and die. Which will kill mom. And you invited him to my house while we're supposed to be socially distant? You two can go to a hotel. Because he isn't coming in here. I wasn't a dick to him. Out of respect for you. But if he doesn't leave now, that's gonna change. So, I had no idea what he was talking about. None. I hadn't connected any of the pieces yet. Because, you've got to remember. Wendell was such a small part of my life until this point. I almost never saw him or thought about him. My whole world had been turned upside down by a pandemic in the preceding few months. He was background noise. Faint background noise. Compared to all the other stuff I had going on. So I just said the first thing that came to mind. Dude, I don't know why you're getting so mad at me. I don't have a boyfriend. I don't know what you're talking about. Someone's got the wrong house. My brother looked like he was ready to rip my face off. He said, we're adults, come on don't fucking lie to me. I'm not mom and dad. We can't deal with this if you're going to lie to my face. And I said I wasn't lying, 
and I think he could tell from my expression and tone that I genuinely was serious. So now he was as confused and irritated as I was and he was like, he didn't just vaguely say he was here for his girlfriend. He used your name, he rattled off a ton of very exact info. I think he said you, uh, yeah. He said you guys had a fight and he was here to work things out. Now, I've been looking for a boyfriend for a long time, so I was half thinking, uh, maybe dreams do come true. Might as well see who it is. But I was also starting to feel a bit sick, in the pit of my stomach, because it would be one thing if this happened on campus or back home. But I had changed states. My brother moved to this state for school and I don't know anyone here but him and his friends. So I finally did the obvious thing and looked through the peephole. I almost didn't recognize him at first because he had showered, shaved, and changed into clean clothes, for the first time since I'd known him. But sure as shit, it was Wendell standing on my brother's doorstep, hundreds of miles from his original corner. I was so scared I couldn't speak. My heart was pounding like I was slipping under deep water with my legs tied. I just backed away from the door and sat down on the couch and tried to collect myself. My brother thought this was my affirmation that there really was some secret older boyfriend who had just made himself known, so it took a minute for him to cut off his ranting and his dramatic, what will grandma think? Stuff. Finally he realized I was tearing up and he sat down, calmed down, and apologized and said we'd figure it out, and I whispered, still out of breath, no, you don't understand. He followed me here. My brother still didn't get it. What? You didn't want him to come here? What was your fight about? He asked, still thinking the guy was my boyfriend. I managed to repress my panic enough to explain the broad strokes to him, but I don't think he fully grasped how creepy it was at that moment, because he was like, you're shitting me. That's hilarious. I'll take care of this. He went to the door and called from behind it. Yo, just checked, she's not here. Must have packed out this morning. You should do the same. I'm taking this social distancing reality seriously and winked at me. That's when, as my brother says when he tells this story, it got real. Wendell said, you're lying. I heard her there. Tell her I'm sorry. I don't know why she's been avoiding me but I cleaned up for her and I'll take her anywhere she wants to go. Tell her that. Tell her. And don't lie. I'll know if you lie. That rubbed my brother the wrong way, and he said back, bro, you're not taking her anywhere. Now get off my deck before we have a problem. And Wendell sounded like he was walking away but instead, he was going over to the window. When I saw him staring, he looked different than I'd ever seen him, even than a few seconds earlier when I'd glanced through the peephole. His clothes were clean, but they didn't fit or match. Eyes bugged out of his head, white stuff caked on the corners of his mouth I hadn't noticed at first, shaking, just kind of disconnected from reality. He started banging on the window shouting things like, that's my girlfriend, you can't keep her in there. You little bitch ass. Let her out you bitch ass. Let her out let her out. I'm coming baby. I'm coming. I couldn't tell if it was meant as a threat or a reassurance. I was so scared. I was too scared to run, or even move. I think my brother was almost as surprised by the sudden outburst. He was rolling up his sleeves like he was preparing to go out there, and I was trying to make my voice work to beg him not to. But I was so anxious, scared, embarrassed, and sad that I had missed all the signs leading up to this, all the opportunities to prevent it that our friendship was never the wholesome thing I thought it was, though of course that's something I had already begun to grapple with before this day, and had so many thoughts swirling in my head, fear being chief among them. All I could do was scream, not words, just, ay ay, and cover my ears to drown the whole situation out. Before my brother could charge out the door, he's an athletic guy, but I don't think he's ever actually been in a physical fight, Wendell punched through the window. Nothing actually happened when he punched through and there was an eerie moment of silence where nobody moved, I think even I stopped screaming. But when he pulled his hand back, all hell broke loose. A fair amount of blood started spurting out when he pulled his hand back through the glass. The things he was shouting started to make even less sense along the lines of, look what you did to me. This is a test. I told you I couldn't be stopped, bitch ass. And the look in his eyes got even more distant. I think the sight of the blood, which has always made my brother really squeamish, made him realize this was real and he finally yelled, damn it sis, call 911. While he leaned against the door which Wendell was now repeatedly running into, even though he was nowhere close to breaking it down. I don't even remember making the call, but apparently I did, because within 10 minutes the police arrested Wendell without resistance. He kept trying to tell them his girlfriend was trapped in the house and he'd come all this way to save her. My poor brother was even momentarily handcuffed and had to explain he hadn't taken me hostage. 
Probably one of the most haunting memories of the whole event is, as they carted Wendell away for a rest, he started singing opera music. I've learned a lot of important common sense and life lessons from this saga. But most of all, Wendell, let's not meet. Hey Reddit, I'm a long time user but due to the nature of this situation I decided to use a throwaway. Trigger warning for baby death, abuse, stalking, etc. Also apologies if this isn't the right sub, we just need answers. My girlfriend's mother is a long time heroin user and has been in and out of jail for my girlfriend's whole life. When she lived with her mother and her mother's husband, she witnessed physical abuse and drug activity. She was forced to move out at a very young age in order to stay alive. She thought her mother was finally clean when her mother announced her pregnancy. After getting over the initial shock, my girlfriend decided to be supportive of her mother since she thought she was clean. That was until her mother overdosed while pregnant. She decided to cut all contact at that point. My girlfriend is also a mandated reporter and last year reported her mother and her mother's husband to the state since she knew it wasn't a safe situation for the baby. The baby died in their house not even a month after birth due to an overdose with signs of physical abuse. My girlfriend's mother was arrested for the murder of her baby and other charges. Her husband was arrested for child endangerment and other charges very recently. At first, the judge did not grant either of them bail. Eventually her husband was granted bail in which he posted. We did not know this until recently, which helped us put some of the pieces together. My girlfriend and I like to sit outside her house in the car and just chat or listen to music. Recently, there have been black cars around my girlfriend's house. She also is frequently followed by black cars when she drives me home. It's the same couple of black cars that do this, they're not just random ones. At first we thought we were just paranoid since everyone was still in jail, but when we found out that the husband was out of jail we began to doubt our insanity. The first major thing happened after my girlfriend and I went on a dinner date. We got home after dark and sat in her car for about 45 minutes before we noticed the same black car passing by us every few minutes. After 10 minutes of that, a different car drove towards us, flicking its high beams on when it got close enough for us to see who was inside. It swerved into the oncoming lane and I genuinely thought it was going to hit the passenger side of the car. It sped away and we ran inside. After that we started noticing the black cars more and more. This past Wednesday morning, around 3am-ish, the same distinct black van that we had been seeing pulled up outside of my house. This was weird because my GF and I live about 30 minutes from each other in two separate cities. A man got out of the van and shined a flashlight through my yard, scanning it almost. He shined the flashlight up at the window I was sitting at, kept it there for a second, then walked 30 feet to an empty driveway, scanned around there for 20 seconds before getting in the van and peeling away. The windows were ice covered and frozen so I couldn't make out the specifics of the van but it was strange. A few nights later my girlfriend and I spent some time hanging out in the car when we spotted a black van, hiding, behind another parked car further up the street. We could only see one headlight, but it creeped up on us as we sat in the car. My girlfriend lives between two dead-end streets, think of a very blocky you, she loves between the two prongs. The van went up the first dead end, four ways on, and sat for a few minutes before turning around and driving almost into the other lane of traffic to get close to us. It then went up the other dead end and stayed put. We thought it was weird that the van didn't just back out of the first dead end, instead opting to drive all the way up the narrow street and turn around. After a few minutes we call a friend and recount the story just to get an extra opinion. While my girlfriend was talking to our friend, I got out of the car to go for a cigarette and to see how far away the van was. I walked up the dead end that the van was on for about 15 feet before getting the worst gut feeling I've ever gotten. Across the street from me was a black mass, which was darker than the darkness around it. I decided to just turn around and rush my girlfriend into the house. Later that night we heard a bang coming from downstairs followed by what sounded like a boot on wooden stairs. We locked the bedroom door and I sat against the door with a baseball bat, hopeful to barricade it. A few minutes later we heard a car door slam before the sound of tires squeezing and a car driving away. Our initial idea was maybe it came from the TV, but we had paused it and the TV in the next room was never loud enough to feel real. When I went downstairs an hour later to get water there was nothing damaged or missing. We theorized that maybe it was the sound of the front door trying to be opened even though it was deadbolt. My girlfriend's exterior wall doesn't face the road and we've never heard car sounds before. It is, however, next to a private driveway, and sometimes we'll hear her grandparents' car door close or the neighbors backing out. The next day I was shoveling the sidewalks at my girlfriend's house, an activity that took about 20 minutes, 
and I saw the same black Chevy Silverado with mud streaks on the tailgate. It circled the block about four times. I was able to see the silhouette of the man driving through the passenger side window, and each time it was the same man in the same truck. My girlfriend lives in a small town and we were able to catalog the neighborhood cars. The black van and truck are abnormal. Our theory is that someone is trying to scare my girlfriend into not testifying, or flat out making sure neither of us ever have the ability to testify. We really just need more opinions. Are we just paranoid or is this something we should actually be worried about? Do you think these are just weird coincidences? 15 years ago, I made one of the worst decisions of my life. I began dealing for a well-known biker gang. No, I wasn't a member, but I had connections to one of their members through my mutual friend, Josh. I had a short history in dealing years before but got clean and walked the straight and narrow. I worked three jobs and was saving for college. However, tragedy struck when a very close relative of mine was murdered by her new husband while they were traveling in his home country. What made this even more difficult is that they had canceled their life insurance so the cost of returning them to our country and the funeral arrangements fell on me and two other close relatives. Now, this isn't an excuse for what I did, I just wanted to provide some context to what was going through my head when I met with Josh and asked to set up a meeting with his relative Mike, who was a member of a well-known biker gang, so that I could get back on my feet financially. If you're asking yourself why I didn't just pursue one of the millions of other avenues for financial assistance, it's because I was young, stupid, and wanted to replace that lost feeling with something I thought would make me feel better about myself at the time. So, I gathered a team of hand-picked dealers at my house and waited for Mike to come by and discuss business, and soon enough he arrived with two pounds of weed in front of me. My plan was to only involve myself by distributing to my runners so that I could work my regular jobs while making a passive income. Side note. I had known Mike for about a year at this point which is why so much was given up front. The term front means to loan and the term runner refers to a dealer who works for you. Things went well over the next year and a half, my team expanded, I was making a ton of money, I sold the weed to my runners by the ounce, paid a discount per pound, and was making hundreds in profit a week and thousands a month. I was happy and Mike was happy, and he only ever had to deal with me and never had to meet or address any of my runners. However. This is where the story takes a drastic turn for the worse and why you should never trust a biker gang, especially when you're not working on the inside. I had just hired a good friend of mine as a runner. She needed money, was a single mother, and wanted to sell it to her friends who came over and always needed weed. This girl ended up selling through ounces faster than anyone else, so I trusted her with more products to sell at once since I would have to come back two or three times a week. However, I was going on vacation for three weeks and wanted to make sure that she had access to enough while I was away, so I left her with a lot more than I usually would. When I returned, I had come to collect and everybody but her was up to date on their payments and after excuse after excuse she came to me to inform me that her new scale was set to the wrong measurement system and that she was out a good amount. I was upset and nearly kicked her off the team, but I've known this girl for years and it wasn't anything I couldn't recover on my own, however she came to me when I was supposed to meet up with Mike to re-up collect more product, and because this took a lot longer than I thought, I was late to meet him. Now, remember when I said that you should never trust a biker unless you operate on the inside? I met up with Mike to let him know what happened, apologized for being late, and informed him that the situation had been dealt with, but Mike was furious. He tells me that, because I was late, he was late meeting his connection for the weed, and since he was late this connection would never deal with him again. He told me to meet him at Josh's house and to bring who was responsible for making me late, and if I didn't bring them, then I would be held accountable because this connection had made him $5,000 per week in profit. Yes, you read that right. This man told me that he once dissolved a profitable relationship with a connection that earned him $5,000 a week. I already knew what this meant for my runner, we were good friends, and there's no way I was going to allow a single mother to go through what I knew was coming. So. I showed up to Josh's house on my own and waited for Mike. I sat on Josh's couch for what felt like hours, by myself, and uncertain of the extent of what was going to happen. Then Mike walks in, greets Josh, talks with his partners a bit, while completely ignoring me. First five minutes go by. Then ten minutes. Then Mike walks over and I remember waking up on the floor. From what I was told, Mike hit me across the head, and I blacked out. He proceeded to hit me for two to three more minutes until I woke up to him still hitting me. We sat on the couch, and with the handgun to my head he tells me that he is going to charge me the profit he would have made every week from his connection for the next year. 
for those keeping track, that's $260,000. He tells me that he's going to be generous enough to do the first payment of $5,000 within 48 hours, that the money that I just gave him for my re-up didn't count, that I needed to return the weed, and that he was giving me 24 hours for each additional $5,000 after that. He took my car, which he underpriced at $10,000, this was a newish Mercedes at the time that I was still making payments on, and essentially planned on using me as a human ATM. At this point I knew what was happening, and despite our relationship for the past year, he was going to exploit me for as long as he could until he had a reason to get rid of me. So, I went home and thought about my options. I had around $17,000 in cash, my RRSPs, savings, which amounted to just over $35,000, but even that would only get me by on the payments for a week. I realized that, even if I was able to come up with half of the money I would end up in jail or worse. After 24 hours of deliberating, I considered the fact that Mike had never met any of my runners, my family had moved away from this town after the death of the relative, and there was no way that I was going to risk my life or my freedom for some arbitrary debt, so I took all my cash, made my savings available, and knew I only had 24 hours to run as fast and as far as I could. For 30 a.m., I gathered a bag full of clothes, called a lifelong friend of mine who had moved to another country four hours away, explained the situation asked if I could stay on his couch for a week, and took a bus as close to the Greyhound station as I could get without stopping in front of it. The Greyhound didn't require photo ID at the time, and I didn't want to fly out of my own city in case anyone saw me, or Mike was able to figure out where I was going by pressing any of the airport staff. At this point my heart was beating out of my chest because, although the Greyhound isn't as busy as the airport, if Mike, or anyone he knew, saw me there it was game over. I waited an hour, then walked inside and bought a ticket for a city 3.5 hours away that had an airport. Before boarding, I wrote down all my important contacts, removed the battery from my phone, dropped it down the sewer, and began my escape. 8.15 a.m., I stop in said city and buy a ticket to go and meet said friend. 12.30 p.m., I land in a country I've never been to, in a city I've never been to. My friend picks me up and we talk about the situation the entire way home. Him and I had a similar past and, although the story itself is ridiculous, he understands. When we arrive at his place, I cut my hair, decide on a new name I'll go by while staying in the city while deciding my next move. I get a new prepaid phone and number and try to relax. 6 p.m., I was supposed to meet Mike 30 minutes ago. The stress starts to kick in. 8 p.m., we've been drinking and telling stories and I remember that I hadn't deleted my Facebook, so I jumped onto my friend's laptop, threw on a VPN that was located in my home country and was met with a flood of messages. Josh and Mike had kicked in my front door and destroyed my place. They left messages with the addresses of places they thought I was hiding out. They told me that they were watching the airport and Greyhound station and told me that it would be impossible to leave the city. It was at that point that I realized, they never knew I left. Throughout the coming weeks, months, and years I made a habit of changing phones, and moved around from city to city, and country to country. I even did those, work for your accommodation, programs in a couple of countries as a tourist. Every few weeks and months I would get an email from a single friend back home who would tell me that Josh or his girlfriend were telling people to assure me that it was okay to come back, and things had blown over. A couple times I even tried to reach out to some other friends back home, only to find out that they were trying to cash in on the reward Mike had placed to anyone who could find out where I was. It eventually became easier to cut contact with anyone and everyone around me if I felt that I needed to move or felt that I couldn't entirely trust them. I could never go back to who I was or where I came from physically or mentally. I later found out that Mike had a nasty habit of hiring dealers, then when he thought they had made a good amount of money he would conjure up some dire situation in which they would need to pay him back a crazy amount. He would drain them for every dime they had until they couldn't pay anymore. After that, they would usually end up in a ditch somewhere. One of his associates, who happened to be my next-door neighbor back home, was recently charged for first-degree murder after taking a woman out to the woods and killing her. Although this did a number on my trust issues, I've made a lot of changes throughout my life since the event. I've changed my name, obviously. I'm in my mid-30s now. I have an amazing corporate position in a company that changes lives. I speak to schools about the impact of poverty, and it's taught me to empathize with people in different positions than my own. I own a condo in a very beautiful city, I'm engaged, I took up learning a second language, and I never take the second chance I've been given for granted. I've been clean for just over 15 years now. I've never told anyone in my new life about what's happened, I don't even think they would believe me. 
even though I take full responsibility for my stupidity in my younger years, to the biker that is waiting to collect on his ridiculous $260,000 debt. Let's not meet again. To understand my story, you sort of have to know a tiny bit about trespassing laws in our country, and that we don't have any so long as you're respectful and non-destructive. You can walk over any hills you like and in my case, camp on any beach of your choosing so long as once you leave the area is how you found it. I used to love camping when I was little. Our family would go multiple times a year with a large group of my parents' friends and their kids. On average there were maybe 10 of us at a time which was a bit of a logistical challenge since we always headed out to this one really remote beach on the coast. Actually we weren't the only ones. There are always yachts bobbing just off the shore with people in them and other campers lining up and down the beach. Most of them also had children or teenagers, so it wasn't a wild party scene. It was very much an informal family holiday spot. There was even a small building with toilets and showers installed nearby even though this was in the middle of nowhere. I guess the local council must have figured it out and got sick of people peeing behind bushes. We took a trip up in spring 2011. I'm really bad with time but I know this because I got my dog in winter 2010, after picking her out that November from the shelter as a birthday gift from me to me, as I paid her adoption fee. Reddit, I know you love dogs and she will be very important to the story later on so let me tell you a little bit about Parmesan. Parmesan came to me as a six-month-old puppy who had been rescued from a dog-fighting situation. We're not entirely sure what breed she is exactly but my best guess is a lurcher slash staffy mix. She is a wonderfully well-tempered dog with people and most dogs but you absolutely do not threaten her, she'll have you. So by the time of this camping trip I'd had Parmesan for a few months. She'd never come camping with us before but far as my family are concerned dogs go on camping trips, so when we all piled into the car she came too. Unusually though none of the family friends could make it, so it was only me, my sister, my dad and my mom. I didn't mind, I wasn't that attached to the other kids, I'd rather play with my dog and I'd still have my sister. The drive took the best part of six hours and because we'd left a bit later, although I don't remember why we'd left later than normal, we arrived at sunset. Not a good time to be building a tent but we'd expected to arrive with other campers already set up and the beach illuminated in campfires. The beach was empty. In spite of this my parents started taking stuff out and trying to build the tent. They asked us to fetch some of the lighter bags from the boot of the car while they sat pointing a flashlight at the sand to see properly. I rolled down the window of the car for Parmesan before getting out. It was pretty hot for that time of year and I wanted her to have air. Always gotta be looking out for my furry little homie. As we're fumbling about in the dark, on a beach, in the middle of nowhere it's pretty spooky. The one road that led to this beach was circular and had a bridge over the water meaning you could basically circle around the beach like a big zero shape if you felt like it. I wasn't really paying any attention to the road, I was complaining I was tired as kids want to do but my mom was. After maybe 15 minutes of my dad trying to nail the tent into the sand, my mom's asking him had he seen that car drive round. It's been a few times. My dad kinda shrugged her off, he's sort of like that. I don't know if he said anything back to her but after a few more minutes a car pulled up next to ours on the road and someone got out. It was maybe 15 or 20 feet from the cars to where we were and the light was pretty low, except for the torches. We weren't expecting to see anyone else out here at this point and I think my mom said it must be the security. I don't know why a random beach would have security. I think what she meant was the wildlife trust or something, as they do occasionally come down to do their nosy. The guy was walking pretty unevenly. He must have been drunk or high because he had that stagger to him. There was absolutely no way this guy was sober. Cool. A junkie. Not an unusual find but it's rare to see them in the wild. As he walked into flashlight range we realized he was carrying a large knife, maybe 15 inches. Although I was small at the time so maybe my sense of scale was off. I don't like my dad but credit to him once he saw this he got up immediately, holding onto the camping mallet and put us all behind him. The man began to shout wildly at us that we can't camp here and he was just letting us know. My dad tried to initially be a bit low key with the guy and told him that was fine we'd leave but this didn't work. He kept coming closer to us, so my dad started shouting and the man kept shouting back. My sister and I were crying. I remember shaking, I was utterly terrified as I'm sure anyone would be in that situation. It really did seem like this guy and my dad were going to fight and I'm going to be honest, 
I didn't fancy my dad's chances. While it's grim to consider, I'm absolutely convinced he would have killed my dad and possibly us as well once he was done as I don't think my mother would have had the common sense to run with us. I love her but she's always put dad and her relationship with him above us. This isn't how it went down. A bolt from the black like a wolf descending on its prey took us all by surprise, most of all the man with the knife. In that moment, Parmesan was the apex predator large canines represent in nature. She got him good by the arm and clamped down hard, ripping his jacket and shredding the skin underneath. He dropped the knife as it had been in the arm she had got him by. He kicked her, he punched her and eventually got her off. He grabbed the knife from the sand and ran back to his car and drove off. Parmesan didn't follow him. She stayed with us, muzzle covered in blood. Quickly as we could we gathered our things and all got back in the car, all pretty shook up by the incident. I looked Parmi over, she was okay, but the car's window was much more open than I'd left it. We think what happened was when the shouting started she must have put her paws up on the gap I'd left for her. As it was an old car and had the Raleigh down windows and not an electric button, we think she must have been able to hit it with her paws to force it down enough to squeeze out. This is not the end of my story. We were all pretty scared and since we had the dog with us, we couldn't book into a hotel for the night. My parents decided just to drive home so we could all feel safe but first had to drive into the nearest town for petrol as they were kind of low. I spent the time trying to clean Parmesan up a little. I'd always loved dogs but what she'd just done for me blew my mind. As we drove into town we came across a petrol station but it looked closed. My dad drove up closer to get a better look and stuck his head out the window to get a better look at the sign. My mom asked him what on earth he was doing and he told her he was trying to see when it opened. Never. My heart fucking sank. Parked in the corner, behind a van so we hadn't seen him at first, was the man with the knife. He was sitting on the bonnet of his car, using some tissue paper to clean up his arm. It looked pretty bad. Without stopping to refuel or look anywhere else in town, my dad drove right out of there. He decided to go to the next town over but this was removed. The next town over was 60 miles away. He didn't have that much petrol, we realized, as we began driving. We were going to break down. That's fine, Dad said, we had AA cover. They'd come to us home or at least to somewhere acceptable for the night. Better than staying in the last town. After driving for maybe five minutes, lights flash us from behind. Another car. The same car the man had been driving. It was him, following us. He must have realized we were low on petrol. The next half hour was one of the worst half hours of my life. I had a complete and utter breakdown, as did everyone really. I could tell my parents were trying to keep it under wraps so it wouldn't upset us but we weren't really little kids, we were both double digits, we knew how dangerous this situation was. Dad turned off the radio to conserve petrol and the man followed us for 55 miles before he peeled away onto another road. Our fuel meter was on the big red E for empty for the last 10 miles, we were driving on fumes. I don't really believe in God but if he does exist that was definitely one of his miracles. Once we got there. We drove into a petrol station and refilled to a full tank before driving the rest of the way home. Sister and I slept in the car after that. I only woke up once we made it all the way home, just grateful nothing worse had happened than that. After getting some sleep, my mom phoned the non-emergency line for the police and reported what had happened. They never got back to her after that but apparently the woman she spoke to said they may wish to in the future, as he matched the description given of a suspect wanted in relation to a murder charge. No idea if he actually was that guy or just a random psycho. As I said, they never got back to her. So what's the takeaway then? Other than a crazy man on the beach, let's not meet. Well, for me it's that I love Parmesan. She's still with us now, old as the hills and twice as grizzled as one of my mom's friends likes to joke. I don't know why she did what she did that day, I couldn't tell you what her thought process was. What I do know is that this poor puppy was born into an environment where they abused and neglected her only to be rescued and taken to a shelter where her mother and siblings all found homes before her. Despite how badly people had treated her, when I took her home she forgave but never forgot. I think the saying is I never trust a person who doesn't like a dog but I always trust a dog when they don't like a person. They have a very good understanding of human body language and I think she must have understood how much danger we were in. If you're able to, please adopt. You might find yourself in a situation like mine one day. I promise you if you're willing to save a four-legged friend's life they will pay you back tenfold if they're able to, without a thought for their own safety. I paid 78 pounds for Parmesan's adoption fee which is a lot when you're a kid but it chills me to my bones knowing if I hadn't been so instant on a dog I might be dead. 
so kind of long-winded, so I'll try to shorten it. I'm now a 25-year-old female, and at the time I was 16 or 17. My then-boyfriend and two of our other friends decided to go camping in a small patch of woods next to a neighborhood that was being developed. And the small patch of woods was roughly 900 feet across both ways. On the left side, if you were viewing it from the road, was the undeveloped neighborhood, no people living in the houses, they're mainly just wood and no windows slash actual walls, and on the right side was about a mile long driveway that led up to a house a little over a half mile past the patch of woods. Pretty deserted. So, we get our tent, fire pit, chairs, etc., set up, and we're relaxing as it starts to get dark, when we hear extremely loud screaming coming from a woman, maybe 400 to 500 feet away. At first there weren't any words we could make out, but then there was a help, and a no, and then the loudest, most terrifying scream was cut off mid-scream. We can't see through these trees, they're thick, it's getting darker. So we get the fuck out, leave all our stuff behind. As we're walking back to the undeveloped neighborhood where we parked, keep in mind the screaming was coming from over that way of the woods, so we had to go out near the long driveway, to the road, around the tiny bit of woods, into the undeveloped neighborhood where we parked. I'm immediately on the phone with police who are trying to tell me it was just a cat in heat. From where we parked, we were facing the woods. A man comes out, dragging something in heavy sheets slash cloth slash something, spots us, and starts coming towards our car. The police pulled in right then, the man ran, and as it turned out, he had killed a woman about 400 feet from where we were camping. Don't know if he was ever caught, but let's not meet please. It was the summer of 2016 and I had just married my longtime girlfriend. Over the course of our 12-year relationship we had traveled to the mountains several times in both summer and winter for camping but also to stay in nice mountain hotels and snowboard the slopes. Naturally, we both agreed this was how we wanted to spend the first few weeks of our marriage. We booked a 20-day stay at a mountainside campground on the other side of the country. We also decided to bring our dogs with us as they too love being outdoors and we generally bring them camping anyway. After two days of road tripping we had arrived, quickly set up and settled in for a good long stay on the mountain. It was beautiful. A couple of days into our trip and we had already met a bunch of fellow campers. We are very experienced campers so we generally attract a lot of attention from novice campers asking for tools or supplies as they see we are well set up. We are usually more than happy to help people get situated if they need matches, cream or sugar, or help setting up their equipment. It was day four or five when she first made her presence known to us. I will refer to this person as she or her as we never learned her name. We were sitting down under the shade of the large pine tree at the edge of our site, drinking beers and playing cards when she seemingly appeared out of nowhere. She was just suddenly right there. Can I pet your dog? She said. Even my dogs didn't see her approach as the very sound of her voice triggered them into a startled frenzy. As the dogs were worked up already, I politely told her no. Then she just stood there, at the edge of our sight. Didn't say a word. Just stood there sort of existing but not really doing anything. She wasn't exactly staring at us or looking at anything in particular. I asked her if she needed anything and she said no. After a few minutes she walked off. I work with people with brain injuries so I've had my fair share of experiences with unusual behaviors including people with poor social skills so I wasn't about to write this person off as creepy just yet, but she had my attention. I casually watched her walk off and enter a campsite across the path and a few sites down from ours. There was already a small tent set up in the site, but she proceeded to pull an even smaller single-person tent from her backpack and began setting it up. The day prior we saw two young girls set up the other tent and were clearly the occupants of the site. There was no further interaction with her that day although we did notice that the owners of the other tent on the site were not around at all that day and we didn't see them return that night. Well. The next morning I am walking to the camp showers to clean up for the day. As I walk past her site, I see she is sitting in her little tent reading a book. The door to the tent is open. I pay no attention and keep on my way to take my shower. When I'm done with my shower and walking back I notice her tent is now closed but it's jiggling about so I know someone is in there. Then she made her presence known in a big way. Just as I am approaching her site on the way to mine, she unzips her tent and I immediately see that she is completely nude. She then positions herself just inside the tent at the door and lets out this over-the-top full-body stretch and holds her arms way up the sky while pushing her chest forward like it was some kind of mating ritual designed just for me. While she does this she lets out what I only describe as an exotic moan. It was pretty obvious she was putting on a show for me. 
I continue on my way to my site and tell my wife about the display I had just witnessed too. We both laughed it off and moved on with our plans today hike a good trail to a waterfall. The trailhead for this hike was accessible from the campground so we didn't have to drive to get there. We just walked the additional two kilometers to the trail. We walked at a good pace so when we got to the trail we decided to stop for a few minutes and take some photos of the surrounding mountains before heading into the thicker bush. After sitting there for maybe five minutes while my wife is taking pictures, she emerges from the trail that leads towards the campground. At first I thought, okay coincidence, she's staying here and this is a pretty common trail. But then she sees that I see her and she stops dead in her tracks and just stands there. Same demeanor as our first encounter. Just standing, not doing anything in particular but also sending creep vibes our way. This was the first time I said to my wife, I think we have a stalker. Confused, my wife then looks to where I'm looking and is immediately a little creeped out. Once again I think, whatever, maybe she's just hiking the trail no big deal. So we continue on the trail at a good pace and she maintains a consistent distance behind us. Our dogs at this point are a little distracted by her and our youngest dog keeps turning around to watch her. I got a little fed up with the dog constantly stopping to look back so I decided we will stop for some water and let this woman pass. Well what does she do, but fucking stop walking when we stop and once again just stands there. Okay so now we are genuinely concerned because this is approaching horror slash suspense movie creep level and I start to wonder what this girl's intentions are. Standing motionless at that distance and refusing to pass us just ramped up the oh shit factor to about 9. So my wife and I agreed to just give up and cut the hike short by taking the shorter loop which was only another half kilometer ahead, and head back to our camp. We managed to get some distance between us by jogging every time we would make a turn and she was out of sight. We didn't see her again until later that night. That night my wife decided to take an evening shower at the camp showers. When she returned to our camp she told me our stalker was in the bathrooms also taking a shower. This time however she was with two other girls and appeared to be getting ready for a night at the club. There is a nearby ski town that has a few night clubs and bars so it was reasonable to see the girls getting ready for a night out. The two girls she was with were the two we saw previously set up at her site. My wife explains that she quickly picked up on the fact that the two girls and our stalker friend were not well known to each other. It was clear that the two girls were close friends with plans to go out party and our stalker was making an attempt to be friends and sort of invited herself to join them in their night out. Now we know the ski town well, and the girls kept reinforcing that they were meeting at a specific restaurant before going to the bar. It was currently 10.30pm and we know the restaurant they were telling her to go to was closed at 10pm. They were lying to her about their plans. The stalker kept asking them too, are you sure this place, are you sure? They convinced her and she then left to her tent to finish getting ready while the two friends stayed in the bathroom to finish their makeup. My wife went on to explain how after she left the two friends were mocking and making fun of our stalker. They were young 20-somethings acting like little girls in elementary school. My wife has no time for that, creepy stalker or not she had to say something to the girls for their behavior. My wife calls them out on their behavior. Well, putting all the catty bitch bullying aside, the girls explained to my wife that the stalker girl had set up her tent on their site when they were staying with a friend in the ski town. When they returned they found her living at their site without invitation. She had just taken it upon herself to take a little corner of their site without knowing them at all. The girls said they were upset with her and trying to make her feel uncomfortable so she would leave, but she wouldn't leave. Of course my wife asked them why they didn't just report her to the park warden. The excuse they gave was they were leaving the next day and didn't want to make a huge deal out of it. So whatever happened between them and the fake late dinner plans and clubbing is unknown to us. About 3 AM that same night we were all awoken to a blood curdling scream right outside our camper. At first I was like, holy shit that must be a wild animal. My wife is trembling, dogs barking, and I am startled but curious. I peel back the window cover to see her, standing motionless on the path outside our trailer. I had the window covered down maybe 8 to 10 centimeters when she appeared to make direct eye contact with me. My heart rate is jacked. What the actual fuck? After gazing in my general direction for what seemed like an eternity, she calmly turns around and walks to her tent. I will make sure our trailer is locked. After a good hour, and a stiff whiskey we manage to get back to sleep. So the next day is Friday. We have friends from a nearby major city coming up the mountains to spend the weekend with us. We haven't seen them in a while so we are excited for a couple days together. Well they are not at our site for 15 minutes and as they are setting up their tent, she mysteriously appears out of nowhere yet again. Like bam there she is, but now this time she is actually on our site. 
I hadn't had a chance to tell our friends about her before she arrived so they were a little more friendly than I was. She asks me once again if she can pet my dog, who during all of this is barking at her. I think I said something like, she isn't being very friendly towards you right now so I would prefer if you didn't. She didn't pet my dog but she also just stood there staring at me like she was considering how she would dismember my limbs. She then notices our friend's tent brand as he is still setting it up and comments on how it's the same model as hers although a larger sleeping capacity. My buddy has picked up on the creep vibes and my general displeasure with her presence so just gives her the, oh you cool, and keeps setting it up. Well she starts grabbing at the tent pegs and picks up the hammer and says she will help him set it up cause she has experience with it. My buddy declines and asks for his tools back. Cue the fucking psychopath stared down but this time she has a hammer in hand, adding to the oh shit factor. She literally just drops everything right there and runs off. I go on to explain the last few days to our friends and they agree we need to keep an eye on her. So by this time the two girlfriends whose site she had hijacked were packed up and gone. It's now Friday night and we've been drinking all day so we're feeling pretty good. It's maybe about 11pm when she walks over to our site again. She says, hey, you guys seem to have a lot of extra room with the tent and the camper. Do you think I could stay with you guys tonight? We could have a lot of fun in there together. My buddy is feeling pretty good from all the day beers so he's pretty forward when he replies, did you just propose a gangbang to us? Now this whole time I'm just sitting in my camp chair with my whiskey taking this all in. She wasn't really taking notice of me at all so far. Then, she smiles, turns her head and looks directly down at me and says, I like your friend. She then turns around and walks away into the darkness of the night towards the forest. What. The. Fuck. We are all now terrified she is going to return. I decided right then and there if we see her again in a creepy fashion I'm calling the park warden. This is getting silly. Well the night is winding down so we all decide to walk together to the bathrooms to clean up for bed. My wife pulls on my hoodie and says, babe, look. I look over to see that the site she was set up on is completely destroyed. Shit everywhere. Just stuff, garbage, clothing, food. Everywhere. I thought okay this is weird, could this have been a bear? No, we would have heard it. I then notice that the tent is gone. She is gone and left the site a complete mess. As luck would have it the park patrol was completing their fire rounds and were at the messed up site when we were returning from the bathrooms. We told them there was a girl staying on her who was acting erratic and we suspected she was squatting on the site based on our conversation with the two girls from earlier in the week. We didn't see her again for the rest of our trip until the last full day. There is a great little lookout point not far from our site which has amazing views of the river and valley below and it was a perfect evening to see the sunset behind the mountains. It was a lovely final send off to an otherwise beautiful honeymoon. Just when we thought we were done with her, she emerged once again from seemingly nowhere. We were sitting on a couple chairs that are bolted in place at the viewpoint, taking pictures of the valley below. As my wife is looking through the camera viewfinder she picks up on the woman in the distance. She is standing in the woods a little ways down the mountain towards the valley, watching us. As her final act, she walked up the mountainside, and sat right beside us on a boulder that was beside the chairs. She says nothing. Just sit there. My wife has the brilliant idea of asking me to take one last picture of the scenery and she gives me a little wink. I pick up on her idea right away and I position myself so this woman is going to be in the picture. My wife wanted this lady's photo in the event something bad happens with her before we can leave the area. We took our final looks out at the beautiful scenery and headed to our camp for the night. We didn't see or hear from her again. Upon reflection we agreed this woman had some serious mental health issues obviously. She had zero social skills, and we did witness her attempt to make friends with those two girls that shafted her in a terrible way. That being said, she did things way beyond the realm of acceptable social awkwardness. There were moments I thought she would pull out a knife and kill us all where we stood. More than that, the stalking. The midnight screaming and running off into the woods at night was terrifying to us and I feel a story worthy of this sub. I do have the photo on a thumb drive somewhere and we'll see about uploading a pixelated photo if it's appropriate. To anyone else the picture just looks like a person is sitting in the shot. But to us, it's a reminder of our wild adventure and the start of our amazing marriage. To our honeymoon stalker, let's not meet ever again. The time in my life in which these events take place is mostly a blur to me. While the events in question stand out in my memory, 
the rest of my time was so ordinary that I barely even have a frame of reference for when this occurred. I'm fairly certain it was probably about three years ago, though. I'm 19 now and still embarrassed to even think about what happened, let alone talk about it, which is why I've taken so long to write it all down. You see, all of these terrifying events happened in my head. My family has a history of schizophrenia, my grandmother still is convinced that people are breaking into her house on a daily basis, so my mom always watches my brother and me for any signs. So, when I started hearing the footsteps, she took it as seriously as she could. Now, I'm not claiming that I'm schizophrenic, as I haven't been diagnosed, but I'm not really sure what caused my hallucinations, and my grandmother's mental state is something that can't be ignored. Okay, now that I've set up some context, here's what happened. The first experience was when my cousin came to spend the night at our house. My brother and I have always been close to our cousins, so one night we invited one of them over to play video games, eat junk food, and stay up late. By the end of the night, we were exhausted, but when we went to go to sleep we realized there weren't enough beds for all of us. My dad had just moved out and had taken the spare bed in the guest bedroom with him, leaving the room bare. Too tired to figure out some other arrangement, we decided to pile a bunch of pillows and blankets on the floor of said guest bedroom and just sleep there. I've always been afraid of the closet in that room. The two sliding doors that revealed the long but shallow storage space felt weird and was always dark. But, I didn't want to show that I was scared so I slept there anyways. I've always been an insomniac, so I lay awake long after the other two had fallen asleep. As I lay there, my eyes closed, I heard footsteps exit the closet, and walk around us, making a circle and exiting through the door to the hallway. I could sense my cousin lying next to me, and I could hear my brother snoring next to him, so I knew it wasn't either of them. I was terrified, staying completely still for hours until I finally passed out. In the morning, my cousin said it was probably my mom. I agreed, accepting the explanation but not really believing it myself. Nothing happened for a while, no footsteps or anything unusual. Until one night a few months later, when my mom took my phone. She had a rule about no phones past 10, and she kept them on the counter in her bathroom. Like many other nights, I decided to sneak into her room while she was asleep and take my phone back so I could play games. My mom was a light sleeper, so I was always slow and quiet when getting my phone. I snuck through her room and into the bathroom. From here I'll explain the layout. My mom's bathroom was kind of shaped like a hallway, leading to her walk-in closet. I always hated that closet and refused to even look into the darkness of the open door. I knew that and the ceiling was a hole to the attic. Well, it was more of a crawl space, and it didn't have a proper attic door, just a panel that you push up on. My whole life I'd been terrified of that attic for no discernible reason, but my fear was about to get a whole lot worse. As I slowly reached for my phone on the counter, I heard a noise from the closet. To this day I'm still not sure if I imagined it or not. It was the sound of something scraping against a piece of clothing. An accident, a sound not meant to be heard by me. But I heard it, and my head snapped to the dark void of the open door. I stopped, feeling like a deer in headlights, when suddenly my body unfroze and I turned all the way around, sprinting into my mom's bed and burying myself under the covers. I had, on occasion, gotten in her bed after a nightmare, so my mom just tiredly asked if I was sleeping in her room tonight. I was too afraid to speak, so I lay there completely frozen until I once again passed out from exhaustion. The next morning, I told my mom what had happened and she dismissed it as my imagination. But that's when the footsteps came back. Every night when I would lay in bed, I would hear someone walking around my room. I was always too scared to open my eyes or even move. After a while of this, I became too scared to sleep in my own room and began sleeping in my mom's room every night. I was hesitant to tell her the reason because I didn't want her to think I was like my grandma. But the footsteps didn't stop. Even in my mom's room. I heard them walking around every single night. It got to the point where I was barely sleeping, and all day I was dreading going to bed. I was fully convinced that someone was living in our attic and that they were getting out at night and walking around. Since the attic had access to the vents, I was extremely paranoid of vents and admittedly still am to this day. I thought someone was in them watching me, even though they're far too small for that to be possible. I eventually confessed to my mom what was happening. Twice she and my brother went up there to look around in an attempt to reassure me that there was no one up there. When that didn't work, my mom took me to a psychiatrist, who prescribed me anxiety medication. I don't know if it helps with other conditions, but all I knew was that it worked for me. Nowadays I don't hear any footsteps, and while I'm still an insomniac who has occasional visual hallucinations, the 
fear of the attic is gone. At family Christmas, my brother brought up my past paranoia in a joking way. Remember when you used to think there was someone in our attic? He asked, in front of a bunch of family members who all stared at me. I knew that look, they thought I was crazy. They questioned what he meant, but I just snapped at my brother for telling everything about my business and went into another room for a while. Even though it's embarrassing to talk about, I'm glad I got the help I needed, or else I surely would have gone truly insane. I guess the moral of the story is, to ask for help, even if your brain tells you that people will think you're crazy. Please take note that my life has completely changed over the last time this situation happened. I'm no longer that evil nor that person I used to behave like. I'm happy that I'm going to therapy to talk with someone about the obstacles that I have used to go through. It started in 2019 when I created a dating profile on Tamiya LGBTQ plus app where a small community can meet friends or find a partner. I continued to use the app for a week but one night when I swiped right on a guy who seemed like my type. I usually don't text back on these dating apps since I feel like people just use it when they are bored. But the guy was actually funny and we had a decent conversation about life and our childhood. After two weeks of talking on the phone and texting, I'll use Connor for his name. Connor wanted to meet with me. I wasn't surprised to hear him ask that because I knew meeting people online was going to get places since it was a dating app after all, so I agreed to meet him. When Friday showed up I was super nervous this was going to be my first time meeting Connor and I didn't know what to do. I gave Connor my address and waited for him to arrive. After waiting for a long time I finally got a text message saying he was outside. I told my mom I was hanging with my friend and then left the house. I saw Connor's gray car parked near the side of the driveway. He was waiting outside leaning his back on the passenger's door and he went to hug me before opening his door for me to get into the car. I felt nervous, it was my first time getting into a stranger's car. I usually don't meet people online in real life because my anxiety is the worst. Connor was six foot tall that was the first thing I noticed when I saw him. He took me to Applebee's, as always you get more conversation through a text than face to face because we only made small talk. Four months went by and it was already New Year's Eve. We have been dating since. I never knew that I'd still be in a relationship but it slowly went down the drain when Connor texted me about him seeing another guy. He didn't even have the courage to call me or even meet with me to tell me that he screwed around with one of his old friends. I felt so hurt and angry. I remembered not being able to get out of bed until my friend made me get out of bed because of her caring for me. I was still angry over the situation and I wanted revenge. Before you judge my actions or tell me how horrible I am as a person you need to understand that I wasn't thinking clearly and I sure wasn't acting on my age that day. I knew that Connor's popularity on social media was huge, I mean he had at least 12, 00 friends on Facebook so I created a fake account and posted a blog page link, speaking badly upon his name, into one of his friends Facebook groups that I was still under. I know how stupid of me to do but again, I wanted revenge for him cheating on me. I left the link in the group for at least an hour or so, because I remember getting a call from Connor, he sounded so angry. Miles, did you post that? He asked me over the phone, my anxiety started to kick in and I was shaking like a dog, I tried to hide it under my frightened tone. They are messaging me about you. Connor, I lie, I could feel my heart beat out of my chest. This was getting too far. Send me the screenshots please, Connor said after hanging up the phone. I froze. I couldn't even think straight. He wanted me to send myself a fake message. He then texts me that the police will be looking into the fake profile I created and my head is spinning. I wanted to cry, I wanted to tell Connor it was me and just be done with it. I created something out of rage, I wanted revenge for something I couldn't control. I became a monster I never knew was inside me. I did send Connor the fake screenshot to his phone then deleted the account. My excuses of explaining myself to him couldn't even save me no matter how much I make. A week eventually goes by and I'm still scared upon the issue. How come the truth hurts more than the lie? But that's what's dreadful about anger, your actions won't always be mature. After a month though, Connor finds out that it was me. I stupidly used the same Pinterest photo I used on the fake Facebook account on my Instagram. Connor wasn't happy. I explained to him that my anger got the best of me about him cheating on me and that I was still learning to act better. Connor did let it slide and I prayed to God every night that my immature mistake never comes back to haunt me because the best revenge is to have enough self-worth not to seek it. Sorry in advance this is my first proper post and I've got several issues that make it a lot harder to do something like this. 
but I've tried my hardest to make it all legible and I think it's understandable dot anyway onto my experience. I keep having these weird dreams. It's always a different situation like an average everyday dream at least that is until I run into this person I used to know and got along with really well. They were honestly really positive people. At first we could just talk openly about anything and honestly for a summer they were really close friends. We fell out at the end of that summer and honestly in the end it was for the best. They turned out to be really toxic. Found out because of an incident including me, a 14 to 15 year old disabled male going through kidney failure at the time, a 14 or 15 year old female, a random guy and a punch in the nuts. A story for another time and place. After the falling out I started doing edgy dumb teenager stuff like trying to summon demons and make trades. Other spiritual stuff like that. I'm now really cringy but I did so because it really hurt having someone you're so close to throw you away from their life like you never mattered. I tried to trade away the happy memories in exchange for the sadness being taken as well that I even tried to exchange various things for someone like that in my life again but obviously as far as I knew it didn't work. They've moved far away now luckily for me but anyway. In these dreams they never changed. It's less like I'm seeing the same person and more like I'm seeing an echo of their personality just a concept of a person in a body I used to associate it with. We talk. I update them about my life as the dream around us stands frozen still. They give me advice and we just sit for a while but at the end there's always this growing ominous feeling just beyond sight. A feeling like a consuming darkness reaching into me from behind. They both disappear and the dream carries until its inevitable conclusion and I wake up. I always feel heavy afterwards. Like I've had a long, deep conversation. I barely remember the little details of the normal dream, but I've come up with these solutions to my problems. Not all of them, but some. I can remember I had the conversation every time and I feel coated in that ominous feeling for a while after waking up. Now you may be thinking, well up you were probably just affected more than you realized by the falling out. And I'd agree with you. But in a way the deals I tried to make were answered by these dreams. And I can't help but think if my dreams are giving me what I tried to trade for them, what may I be losing in return? Hi, I have been listening to your content for a while now and love the channel. I felt that it is time to share my experience that I lived in my early teen years and I hope to encourage people to not dabble with evil entities. So here goes. This has happened to me many years ago which is about spiritualism by playing with the Ouija board. When I was about 15 years old, some childhood friends and I were quite fascinated with paranormal things like ghosts, private base phenomena such as UFOs etc. We would sometimes venture out to such places to try to encounter things. Mind you, we are talking about the mid to late 90s when intelligent phones did not exist but digital gadgets were on the cusp of breakthrough. Anyways, one day a friend and I, during summer vacation, decided to get a Kija board and go to another best friend's house and play with it. Everything went according to plan. In the morning we met up, obtained a Ouija board from a local supermarket and went to our friend's house in the neighborhood we all grew up in. We gathered in his bedroom turned the lights off, lit a couple candles and asked questions, it moved slightly but really never got any type of full-on encounter or experience. So we said, whatever, and continued the day of hanging out and enjoying each other's company during summer vacation typical teenage summer vacation fun. But, this is where the crazy stuff began. Around a week or so later, I was at my house laying down on my bed in my bedroom around 8pm. I was just laying down relaxing, listening to music, then all of a sudden, I heard footsteps run up my bedroom wall outside of the house and then run across the roof quite quickly. Now, my bed was against the wall, and I literally heard footsteps run up the same wall outside of where my bed was against, and it sounded like a child running quickly. That was the length and span of each step, and it sounded like the entity was bipedal and running really fast. I was quite surprised and didn't know what to do. I then went to the kitchen where my mom was washing the dishes, and I asked if my stepdad was on the roof doing some type of maintenance, and my mom was surprised at the question and said, no, he's not up on the roof. I then returned to my room and thought about it for a while. Eventually, I forgot about it. Shortly after, I recall late at night, when everyone was asleep, I would suddenly feel fear out of nowhere in my room and suddenly get paralyzed. It was crazy because when I felt the fear, it felt like a super fast rush of wind would race towards me and fill me, enter my being and I would be paralyzed. My eyes rolled back all the way and it was a level of fear and rage that I cannot describe in human words that would fill my whole being. Such incidents would begin to happen about once a week and evolve to two to three times a week for about four years throughout high school. 
Then it got to a point where one night I sensed the same fear entering my room while my whole family was asleep in their respective rooms and again, such an entity rushed and entered my body. My body arched and then I felt myself levitate to the ceiling where my nose almost touched the ceiling. Then my body slowly returned back to the bed, I remember feeling everything and being able to see even though my eyes were rolled to the back of my eye sockets. I was able to feel the bed sheets over my body and hanging and I was able to see how I was levitating nearer to the ceiling and everything. There was another incident where the same thing happened, and while I was paralyzed in such state, I remember using all my force and energy and moved my head towards the door of my bedroom, because while I was paralyzed, it was super super hard to move any body part, let alone my mouth to scream for help or anything, and after looking at the bedroom door, in an attempt to run and escape such horrifying experience, I mustered up as much energy and motivation possible and I tried leaping off my bed to run for the door, what I am about to describe is unbelievable but I am speaking from first-hand experience, and my inner self, soul, or spirit, jumped out of my body and I hit the floor, I then started crawling to the door and was going to reach for the door knob, but then I looked back to the bed and saw my body paralyzed with my eyes rolled back. I couldn't believe it. Then all of a sudden my soul slash spirit rushed back to my body and the entity left my body. The word terrifying does not begin to describe what one feels in such experiences. There were other nights where my mom, stepdad and siblings would go grocery shopping at night and I would stay at home watching T.V and while in the living room, I would hear about 15 to 20 feet away from the living room, down the hall where the three bedrooms of the house were, I would hear one doorknob of one of the rooms turning and letting go, turning and letting go. Obviously no one was in the house and I would feel a presence back there but did not dare to go investigate. I remember calling one of my best friends on the phone to distract my attention from that. Also, when those things were happening, Every time I laid down on my bed sideways at night with my back facing the room and my face towards the wall, I would always hear people whispering in the room right behind me, and when I turned around to see, the whispers stopped. It would happen so much that I stopped laying down sideways to sleep or if I laid down sideways, my face would be towards the room and my back against the wall. I can describe so many more experiences but I would have to turn this into a book with chapters, lol. Thankfully, years have passed. I am a full grown man now and those experiences and entities have dwindled away. I started going to church and it all faded away. To conclude, my word of advice is, never dabble with the Ouija board.